Francois Villon. Francois Villon, born in Paris in 1431 and disappeared from view in 1463, is the best known French poet of the late Middle Ages. A ne'er do well who was involved in criminal behavior and had multiple encounters with law enforcement authorities, Villon wrote about some of these experiences in his poems. Villon was born in Paris in 1431. One source gives the date as Villon's real name may have been Francois de Moncorbier or Francois de Loges. Both of these names appear in official documents drawn up in Villon's lifetime. In his own work, however, Villon is the only name the poet used, and he mentions it frequently in his work. His two collections of poems, especially Le Testament, have traditionally been read as if they were autobiographical. Other details of his life are known from court or other civil documents. From what the sources tell us, it appears that Vion was born in poverty and raised by a foster father, but that his mother was still living when her son was 30 years old. The surname Vion, the poet tells us, is the name he adopted from his foster father, Guillaume de Vion, chaplain in the collegiate, and a professor of canon law, who took Vion into his house. Francois describes Guillaume de Vion as more than a father to me. Vion became a student in arts, perhaps at about 12 years of age. He received a bachelor's degree from the University of Paris in 1449 and a master's degree in 1452. Between this year and 1455, nothing is known of his activities. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition, attempts have been made, in the usual fashion of conjectural biography, to fill up the gap with what a young graduate of Bohemian tendencies would, could, or might have done, but they are mainly futile. On June 5, 1455, the first major recorded incident of his life occurred. In the company of a priest named Giles and a girl named Isabeau, he met, in the Rue Saint-Jacques, of Breton, Jean Le Hardy, a master of arts, who was also with a priest, Philippe Chermoy. A scuffle broke out, daggers were drawn and Sir Mays, who was accused of having threatened and attacked Vion and drawn the first blood, not only received a dagger thrust in return, but a blow from a stone, which struck him down. He died of his wounds. Vion fled, and was sentenced to banishment, a sentence which was remitted in January 1456 by a pardon from King Charles VII after he received the second of two petitions which made the claim that Sermis had forgiven Vion before he died. Two different versions of the formal pardon exist. In one, the culprit is identified as Francois de Loges, Autremont de Vion, in the other as Francois de Moncorbier. He is also said to have named himself to the barber surgeon who dressed his wounds as Michel Mouton. The documents of this affair at least confirm the date of his birth, by presenting him as 26 years old or thereabouts. Around Christmas 1456, the chapel of the College de Navarre was broken open and 500 gold crowns stolen. Vion was involved in the robbery and many scholars believe that he fled from Paris soon afterward and that this is when he composed what is now known as the Petty Testament or Elise. The robbery was not discovered until March of the next year and it was not until May that the police came on the track of a gang of student robbers, owing to the indiscretion of one of them, Guy Tabri. A year more passed, when Tabri, after being arrested, turned King's evidence and accused the absent Vion of being the ringleader, and of having gone to Angers, partly at least, to arrange similar burglaries there. Vion, for either this or another crime, was sentenced to banishment, he did not attempt to return to Paris. For four years, he was a wanderer. He may have been, as his friends Renier de Montigny and Colin de Cailloux were, a member of a wandering gang of thieves. The next date for which there are recorded whereabouts for Vion is the summer of 1461. Vion wrote that he spent that summer in the bishop's prison at Moung sur Loire. His crime is not known, but in Le Testament dated that year he inveighs bitterly against Bishop Thibaut d'Assigny, who held the See of Orleans. Vion may have been released as part of a general jail delivery at the accession of King Louis XI and became a free man again on 2 October 1461. In 1461, he wrote his most famous work, Le Testament. In the autumn of 1462, he was once more living in the cloisters of Saint Benoit and in November, he was imprisoned for theft in the fortress that stood at what is now Place du Châtelet in Paris. In default of evidence, the old charge of burgling the College of Navarre was revived and no royal pardon arrived to counter the demand for restitution. Bail was accepted, however, Vion fell promptly into a street quarrel. He was arrested, tortured and condemned to be hanged, but the sentence was commuted to banishment by the Parlement on January 5, 1463. Vion's fate after January 1463 is unknown. 
Rabelais retells two stories about him which are usually dismissed as without any basis in fact. Anthony Bonner speculated the poet, as he left Paris, was broken in health and spirit. Bonner writes further. Villon was a great innovator in terms of the themes of poetry and, through these themes, a great renovator of the forms. He understood perfectly the medieval courtly ideal, but he often chose to write against the grain, reversing the values and celebrating the low lives destined for the gallows, falling happily into parody or lewd jokes, and constantly innovating in his diction and vocabulary. A few minor poems make extensive use of Parisian thieves' slang. Still, Villon's verse is mostly about his own life, a record of poverty, trouble, and trial which was certainly shared by his poem's intended audience. In 1461, at the age of 30, Villon composed the longer work which came to be known as Le Grand Testament. This has generally been judged Villon's greatest work, and there is evidence in the work itself that Villon felt the same. Besides Le Lys and Le Grand Testament, surviving works of Villon include 16 shorter poems, varying from the serious to the light-hearted and eleven poems in thieves' jargon which were attributed to Villon from a very early time, but which many scholars now believe to be the work of other poets imitating Villon. Villon's poems are sprinkled with mysteries and hidden jokes, they are peppered with the slang of the time and the underworld subculture in which Villon moved, replete with private jokes, and full of the names of real people from medieval Paris. A new English translation by David Georgi came out in 2013. The book also includes Villon's French, printed across from the English, and notes in the back provide a wealth of information about the poems and about medieval Paris. More than any translation, Georgies emphasizes Villon's famous gallows humor, his word play, jokes, and puns. For the complete works, another option is Barbara Sargent Bauer's very literal translation which also includes 11 poems long attributed to Villon but possibly the work of a medieval imitator. A translation by the American poet Galway Kinnell contains most of Villon's works but lacks the shorter poems. Peter Dale's ingenious first translation follows the poet's rhyme scheme faithfully, though the necessity of finding rhymes requires him to frequently stray from literal faithfulness. Other fine translations include one by Anthony Bonner, published in 1960, and another by John Heron Lepper, from 1926. One drawback common to these English older translations is that they are all based on old editions of Villon's texts, that is, the French text that they translate is a text established by scholars some 80 years ago. The refrain Where are the snows of yesteryear? is one of the most famous lines of translated poetry in the English-speaking world. It comes from the Ballad of Dead Ladies, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's translation of Villon's Ballade des Dames du Temps Jadis, where the line is, Mais sentles neige d'antan. A very loose but lively English takeoff on a scattered selection of Villon poems was made by Stephen Rodifer in 1976, under the pen name Jean Calais. Translations of three Villon poems were made in 1867 by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Klaus Kinski, the German actor, was an admirer of Villon and performed his work many times. There are recordings of Kinski reciting Villon on CD and vinyl. Villon's poems enjoyed substantial popularity in the decades after they were written. In 1489, a printed volume of his poems was published by Pierre Levé. This edition was almost immediately followed by several others. In 1533, poet and humanist scholar Clement Morrow published an important edition, in which he recognized Villon as one of the most significant poets in French literature and sought to correct mistakes that had been introduced to the poetry by earlier and less careful printers. In 1960, the Greek artist Nanda dedicated an entire one-man art show to François Villon with the support of André Malraux. This took place under the arches of the Pont Neuf and was dominated by a gigantic 10-meter canvas entitled Hommage à Villon depicting the poet at a banquetable with his concubines. See also Ezra Pound's musical setting of Villon's Le Testament opera as a work of literary criticism concerning the relationship of words and music. Daniela Fisherova wrote a play in Czech that focused on Vion's trial called Hadina Mezismovlikum translated to Dog and Wolf but literally translates as The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. The Juilliard School in New York City mounted a production of the play directed by Michael Meyer with music by Michael Philip Ward in 1994. Bertolt Brecht's Bale was written from 1918 to 1919. He based the main character Bale after François Vion. Some of the lyrics Brecht wrote for Three Penny Opera are translations or paraphrases of poems by Villon. John Nurskin wrote The Brief Hour of François Villon in 1937, a work of historical fiction. Henry Living's The Quick and the Dead Quick, 
is an unconventional historical drama about François Villon. A 1935 play by the Czech authors Jan Varish and Jiri Voskovec called Ballade as a was inspired by Villon's work and adapted some of his poems as lyrics for a number of songs. The Italian singer-songwriter Fabrizio De Andre composed the concept album Tutti Marimo Estento whose lyrics are inspired by the poetry of François Villon. The Russian bard singer Balat Okudzava has a song called The Prayer of François Villon. For English translation of the song, go to https colon slash slash soundcloud.com slash Mika Tubinschlock slash prayer, translated and performed by Mika Tubinschlock. Villon was an influence on American musician Bob Dylan. The German singer-songwriter Wolf Biermann wrote a ballad over Villon, Ballade auf den Dieck de François Villon in 1968, available on the Chashi Strasse 131 LP. The French singer-songwriter Georges Brassens has a song called Ballade des Dames du Temps Jadis, where he puts Villon's poem into music. Claude Debussy composed the Trois Ballades de François Villon, published in 1910, based on Villon's poetry. The Swiss composer Frank Martin's poem De la Morte, for the unusual combination of three tenors and three electric guitars, is based on three Vion poems. The British modern jazz group, the Don Rendell, Ian Carr Quintet, included a track Lane Estantan on their album Phase 3. The French singer-songwriter Leo Ferre put Ballade des Penjus to music in his album La Violence et la Nuit. French black metal band Peste Noir adapted the song into a black metal version entitled Ballade contre les Animes de la France for their album. Ballade Cunter Lowe and Emmy Franker. You're like a Villonian singing nun is a line in the song Jonesy Boy from Cass McCombs' album Catacombs. Vagrancy and being an outlaw are running themes in McCombs' work. Ballade de Mercy is sung authentically in medieval French by neo medieval German band Corvus Corax. The 1925 operetta The Vagabond King is also based on the McCarthy play, and it too has been filmed twice in 1930, with Dennis King and Jeanette MacDonald, and in 1956 with Oresti Kirkop and Catherine Grayson. However, in the operetta, Vion is appointed king for 24 hours, and must solve all of Louis I's political problems in that amount of time. Ezra Pound included passages from Le Testament in the libretto of his opera of the same name, to demonstrate radical changes in the relationship of words and music under Vion's pen, changes that Pound believed profoundly influenced English poetry. Pound composed the original score in London between 1920 and 1921, with the help of pianist Agnes Bedford. It then underwent a succession of revisions to better document the rhythmic relationships between words and music. These included a concert version for the Salle Playelle in Paris in 1926, a rhythmically complicated score edited by George Antile in 1923, a hybrid version of these earlier scores for broadcast by the BBC in 1931, and a final version fully edited by Pound, in 1933. The 1923 Pound slash Ant Heil version was premiered in 1971 by the San Francisco Opera Western Opera Theater, conducted and recorded by Robert Hughes, with Philip Booth in the role of Vion. Portions of this LP have been re-released on Other Minds Audio CD Ego Script or Cantaleni, the music of Ezra Pound. The opera was first published in March 2008. In Richard Strauss' opera Der Rose and Cavalier, at the end of Act 1 the Marshal Lind sings, Such dear denchen a vom bergen in yar, an allusion to the refrain from the Ballade des Dames du Temps Jadis. In 1901, the playwright and Irish MP Justin Huntley McCarthy wrote a novel, If I Were King, imagining a swashbuckling Vion matching wits with Louis XI, climaxing with Vion finding love in Louis Court and saving Paris from the Duke of Burgundy when Louis makes him constable of France for a week. Though largely fictitious, this proved to be a long-running success for the actor Sir George Alexander on a perennial on stage and screen for the next several decades. Truman Capote's novel In Cold Blood uses the first four lines of Vion's Ballade des Penchus as an epigraph. The preface of Hunter S. Thompson's book uses a rather loose translation of Vion's Ballade du Concours de Blois. In my own country I am in a far-off land slash slash I am strong but have no force or power slash slash I win all yet remain a loser slash slash at break of day I say good night slash slash when I lay down I have a great fear slash slash of falling. In a short story by Robert Louis Stevenson, A Lodging for the Night, Francis Vion, searching for shelter on a freezing winter night, knocks randomly at the door of an old nobleman. Invited in, they talk long into the night. Vion openly admits to being a thief and a scoundrel but argues that the chivalric values upheld by the old man are no better. The story appears in the collection New Arabian Nights. 
In Ryunosuke Akutagawa's The Life of a Stupid Man, published in 1927 after his suicide, Akutagawa mentions being truly moved by the own's work. He writes he found in that poet's many works the beautiful male and states he feels like he is waiting to be hanged like the own, unable to keep fighting in life. In Osamu Desai's The Own's Wife, a young woman who is married to a dilettante comes to understand his destitute ways when she takes on the duty of paying off his debts. The ne'er do well is a womanizing writer who is unsuccessful. The setting is occupation period Japan. In Leo Parrot's Leonardo's Judas, Vion is revealed, in the postscript, as the true identity of Mancino, a character who has lost his memory. The line I know it all, myself I do not know is the refrain of some poetry recited by this character in Chapter 3. He is a minor character in Tim Powers' The Stress of Her Regard, having lived into the 19th century through his association with the vampire Clamia of the novel. He is a major character in Mathemindy by Christopher Harris, which depicts Vion's life after his disappearance. In Catch-22, Joseph Heller's protagonist Yasarian laments the death of one of his bomber's flight crew, Snowden, with Where Are the Snowdens of Yesteryear? As well as in French, Usan Le Neige Don Don? In Antonio Scarmetta's novel, El Cartero de Neruda, Vion is mentioned as having been hanged for crimes much less serious than seducing the daughter off local bar owner. In Edward Rutherford's 2013 novel Paris, in Chapter 8 set in 1462, Vion is a regular in the Rising Sun Tavern, a gathering place for thieves and criminals, and reads two ballads from the Testament to the Tavern's patrons. The manner of Vion's death is a central plot point in April in Paris, one of Ursula K. Le Guin's first published stories. He is referred to in John Steinbeck's novel Sweet Thursday, as a point of comparison for the roguish Joseph. Valentine Sokolovsky. The night in the city of cherries are waiting for Francois, on Francois Vion's life and form of a person's memories who knew the poet and whose name one can find in the lines of the testament. Vion's poem Tado Tavern Zetophia was translated into English by 19th century poet William Ernest Henley as Vion's straight tip to all cross coves in one of the attributed poems in Thieves Slang is Vion's Good Night. Robert Lowell in his book Imitations, published translations, Callid imitations because they attempt to retain the spirit of the originals rather than the letter, of five of the own's poems, The Great Testament, Ballad for the Dead Ladies, The Old Lady's Lament for Her Youth, Vion's Prayer for His Mother and Vion's Epitaph. Basil Bunting chose Vion as a model for his own life and Vion was the first poem he allowed to be preserved. In 1914 the film The Oubliette features Murdoch McCory as Vion, Lon Chaney as Bertrand de Lapain and Doc Crane as the King Louis XI. If I Were King was filmed as a straight drama twice, as a silent in 1920 with William Farnham as Vion and Fritz Leiber as Louis, and as a talkie in 1938 with Ronald Coleman as Francois Vion and Basil Rathbone as Louis. In 1927, John Barrymore also starred as Vion in The Beloved Rogue, directed by Alan Crossland, opposite Conrad Veidt as Louis. Though not officially based on the McCarthy play, it draws on the same fictitious notions of relations between Vion and Louis. Errol Flint played Vion in a short TV episode, entitled The Sword of Vion, directed by George Wagner. In a 1956 episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents entitled The Better Bargain, a poetic hitman is inspired by Vion. Once, centuries ago, there was a French hoodlum called Francois Vion, he says. He was just like me, and no good crook and a killer. But whenever he was in love, he'd turn into a poet. In a 1961 episode of Bonanza entitled The Frenchman, the title character believes he is the reincarnation of Vion. Early in the film The Petrified Forest, Betty Davis' character is reading a collection of Vion's poetry. Later she reads a few lines of ballad for a bridegroom to Leslie Howard's character, and in the final scene she again quotes ballad for a bridegroom. In the film, she pronounces Francois Vion as Francis Villain, and the Leslie Howard character corrects her, saying the double L is silent as it approximately is in modern French. Vion's inkwell is an artifact in the sci-fi television series Warehouse 13. The ink from the inkwell creates a portable black hole through which items can be passed when it is poured on a solid surface. During the television series Downton Abbey's Christmas special, the Dowager Countess uses the line May Usan Le Neige Danton, to refer to Lord Hepworth's father whom she met in the late 1860s. In the film Himizu, the main characters quote his ballad several times when they are in miserable situations. In the role-playing game, by White Wolf Incorporated, Vion is portrayed as the vampire prince of Paris. In the comic Dylan Dog, 
episode Totentance published in Dylan Dog Gigante No. 1, Balad de Penjus appears in Italian as Balada degli Impiccati translated by Dylan Dog's creator Tiziano Sclavi. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.